Testing one, two, three. This live stream started is that um, it is identified as an elementary kindergarten to grade six session, but most of the pieces are overlapping um, no matter what in panel. If you have children in, in the high school grades, a lot of the content we're covering um, is very similar. We are recording it, so you can go back and check in on some of the things that maybe we went too quickly or you missed. Or um, 
you can share with some of your other parents in the community that um, they can refer to going back. So we do look forward to kind of addressing some of the uh, questions that have come our way in learning technologies through the system and uh, trying to make sure that we are, know that we're in partnership with this together in this very fluid and stressful and uncertain times. Before we get started and go over the agenda and the topics of being covered today, we will just uh, ground ourselves in the moment with, uh, first of all, respectfully acknowledging that our board is located on the ancestral, traditional, and unceded Indigenous territory of the Algonquin peoples, on whose territory we pray, learn, play, and work. And of course, in this time of stress and anxiety, and uh, there's lots to celebrate too, but we know that there's lots on our minds from our family to work to, to school. Um, to think of a, a person or something or a situation that could use some extra thoughts. And I will lead ourselves in, in prayer and grounding that together. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of hope, comfort and restore all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. May they know the power of your healing love. Make us willing agents of your compassion. Strengthen us as we share in making people whole. In the, name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so just moving forward a little bit. Here's the breakdown of the of the session. And a lot of this was shared in the um, information that was blasted out to try to advertise this session. And basically, we do have a Google form that is currently live. Um, you can see it on the left hand side, um, tinyurl.com. So you would open up a separate browser on your screen and type in tinyurl.com slash uppercase OCSB tech questions, plural. And in that moment, you can um, click on this and um, it will open up a screen that looks and a Google form that looks exactly like this. You can type in your email and then what is your question. And I will narrow down what the focus of this session is in just a moment, but we know there's lots of questions and they are all granted and valid. And um, we know that we are working together with our uh, elementary and intermediate secondary virtual uh, academy and learning school environment uh, leaders, as well as learning technologies and all our school departments, as well as with our Catholic Parents Association. So this set this session and the session this morning comes from the feedback where we thought it would be very helpful to, to do such a session. We're also going to be looking at uh, infusing those pre-submitted questions. We've looked at, uh, Rob and I, the themes of those questions, and a lot of them will be infused into what we are uh, presenting on this live stream, as well as we will be monitoring the form so that afterwards we can try to address some of them near the end of this live stream. So things such as uh, students OCSB.ca uh, account, Google account, and pa possible password resets. Chrome profiles, an overview of the student portal, Papara workspace and student dashboard. Those were a lot of uh, themes that came uh, at us through uh, the principles. And again, this is, um, is it might be directed in, in the way it was advertised to virtual um, school um, parents and families, but we know that if a school or a person or a uh, student has to be at home, they may find work in Haparo Workspace. So this is applicable to everybody, a lot of these um, items on this session. And then Rob will jump in afterwards with the uh, parent portal discussion, some digital forms, and of course, answering more questions. Before we do that, I just will kind of ground ourselves a little bit in, uh, again, what the show they're learning. So such as Hapara and uh, with Google and so forth. We know that people have to be able to access that with working technology, and we know things all have to come into place with uh, logistics. So things such as scheduling and assessment and those type of tech troubleshooting, um, we won't be displaying or, or displacing from this conversation because we do need to address it. But in this moment, we are going to focus a lot on the, um, the sort of getting people into their learning at the moment in time. Again. Just if you are uh, missed the URL, that's tinyurl.com slash OCSB tech questions. And if that goes into another browser at the top, you can submit that Google form anytime uh, during the session here. We are monitoring it for questions pertaining to those topics at the moment. 
especially at the beginning of the uh, school year, um, we had a lot of questions about our o at ocsbstudent.ca Google account information and what that means to uh, my, my child, especially with this being more focused at K to six. Um, it could be for anybody who's new to our school system that had just received an, uh, an, an email address as well. But in a lot of cases, it might be your, your child in junior kindergarten or somebody who's gone into grade one and uh, now we're learning at home as opposed to in the classroom uh, through our virtual format. So I'm just going to go over a couple of commonly asked questions and uh, address some of the questions on that form. Uh, the first one is, is that um, some of the questions were pertaining one about how do I get my students uh, email address and every year, like as soon as your child is registered, they're, they're given an, and created a Google account um, within our board. And at the bottom here, you can see it's usually first name dot last name at ocsbstudent.ca. There is the occasional instance where the names match another student. And so it may be first name dot last name one at ocsbstudent.ca, but commonly it's just as shown there. And I, I will use the word given or created password because when they are, um, registered in our board and this account is issued, we will have to um, talk about how do we get that password to you. But before we do that, some of the questions we've received on there is about what is kind of Google for education? What does that entail uh, about um, what it means to my, my child's data and the, and the sort of safety and security and privacy of that? So I'm going to get Rob to pop on and maybe answer uh, some of that background questions for that. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Yeah, there's several questions actually in, in our queue about this, and it's about did we work with privacy commissioners and things like that. So as you may have witnessed, we have been moving all of our content into the cloud to make sure that it's accessible um, anywhere, anytime for our students and off of a specific device so that we become device agnostic. So whatever device is avail available should be able to access it through a browser. So that's been our goal. And pretty much we've achieved that goal now, except for some high-end classes uh, in high school. Our content, um, for a large part of it, is stored within Google mm -hmm. and their Google Cloud. And we have worked with the Ministry of Education and their lawyers on contracts with Google that go beyond what you would see in your personal privacy uh, contracts if you use Google accounts yourself. So we have additional contracts, like legal contracts, with them that uh, we have actually put in place for the management of the storage and deletion of content with school boards in Ontario. So there were a lot of questions. I hope that answers a lot of them because um, that's kind of how they're directed. But the privacy commissioners in Ontario and Canada are certainly uh, involved in these things. And uh, they were all part of this decision to allow school boards to go this way. And in Ontario, that's why they also drafted extra legal contracts with organizations that we were working with in the cloud. Thanks, Rob. And I know that when we, we were sending home the responsible use agreement, sometimes there is another culture and they would be able to take this uh, information, which is the request from you, um, you're the parent um, or in class, if it was not virtual, the student just saying, I would like to reset my, my password. And um, this is not done automatically every year. The passwords do continue on from year to year unless it's changed. It can be done um, if you remember your password via the student portals, which we'll go to in just a few moments, and you could manually reset it. However, if you don't know the password, it does involve that request from your child's teacher. If you've never had the password, the terminology is still the same because the process of a created a new account, um, you would still reset the password from the teacher end and give your novel, your new password to the family and therefore the student would be able to log in. So a lot of times it does affect our JK grade ones that are coming home, especially learning at home now, but it also can affect new um, students who are enrolled in our in our board. So that's the process. Reach out um, to your um, classroom teacher. And again, we just address that new password piece from that same uh, endpoint. Okay, so I'm going to uh, quickly uh, flip over into a different view um, from a student. 
And uh, I'm going to pull over a student you should see sliding into your screen. And this is my friend, uh, student uh, 18. So student 18, um, we've got to the elementary student portal. So on every school's website, um, there is a link to the student portal. So you, even if you're virtual, you had a homeschool or could. If not, they're also linked on our ocsb.ca um, webpage. And so when you are in your account as a student and you've logged in, you will be able to access and you can still ac access other pieces of the student portal. We mentioned the password change tool here. You could click on that and run through that if you knew what your existing password was. If you do not remember that, it is a request to the classroom teacher to reset things for you. Before we jump into um, workspace and student uh, dashboard, uh, Hapara workspace and student dashboard, I'm gonna talk about our Chrome profiles a little bit. And what that means for Chrome pro profile is there's two things that we'll be talking about. I'm gonna open up a Google page just to make it a little bit, um, a little bit kind of more viewer friendly uh, for you. On the top right of the page when I'm logged in, and this I'm gonna emphasize the device because we're gonna talk about the differences between Chromebooks and the differences between maybe a PC or a Mac. First of all, I'm using the Google Chrome browser. And in this case, um, I've downloaded it to my device and I've opened it up and I need to do two things. One is on the Google page, which is the web page, you could be signed into your account. In this case, it's student 18. A lot of times people are signed in here to their Google, their ocsbstudent.ca Google account, but they're not signed up up here, which is their Google Chrome browser. A lot of the requests from teachers and issues with um, some of our, our families not being able to get logged into Hapara um, or Workspace, it comes from not being logged into Chrome. We've tried to make the user experience as easy as possible by uh, allowing you to click on the icons on the student portal and using a process called single sign-on, which means that using your Google Chrome um, OCSB uh, password, you don't have to enter another password or sign in every time. So that's where we need to make sure that when we're in here, we're also logged in to Google Chrome. And there is some videos we can direct people to. Um, I know that was in our previous CSPA uh, uh, newsletter that came out and we'll kind of direct you where those newsletters are afterwards. But Google Chrome here is when I'm on a browser on my PC or on my Mac, which allows me to kind of keep accounts separate conflicting uh, data. If I'm on a Chromebook and I log into my ocsbstudent.ca account, this process has already been done for you. Two birds, one so a stone, so to speak. But there still are some differences between a Chromebook that we've provided in our board and a Chromebook that you may have purchased and the account that we provide versus a typical Gmail account. So I'm gonna throw that over to Rob to elaborate. Hi again, everybody. So there are several levels and I talked about going to the cloud and our, our goal to move everybody off of uh, singular types of de platform devices. So with that, we did settle on this Google platform that is up in the cloud. And part of it is when you go to any device, we go through the browser and log in like Bill said. So that gives you access. Those accounts under ocsbstudent.ca are managed accounts by the school board and part of having that student account allows us to push out certain things to the account, like specific software applications and extensions for Google that we use in learning for our students. Mm -hmm. uh, it also will give them access to their portal and other uh, pieces of software that require single sign-on access. So they need to have an account to get onto those applications. So <clears throat> that differs a little bit in our Chromebook our Chromebooks also, you may purchase some for your kids, or we may have some purchase for the board. Um, those, if we purchase them, are also managed. We get a different level of control for those. So now we can manage more about the hardware. We can reset the device. We can um, also push out specific updates and things like that to the device if it's a managed device. At home, if you bought your own Chromebook, the students still can sign in with their, their school uh, login 
And that sign-in will give them access to all that software that we're providing for students. One of the questions that actually came up was, well, what if we signed in first time with our, our students' uh, login? So if you did that, it's not a recommended practice. The best, especially if they also have a private account, the best thing to do is actually sign in first with a private account and then add on a school account because it handles, the device is handled differently if you do it one way versus the other. So if you do that, I'm not going to give the lessons, but you can reset the device and redo it. So nothing will break because it's all been in the cloud, but you can have the, the device reset and then you can just go in and log in again with your personal account first and then log in with the student account for the board second. When you're on any other device, whether it's a Mac or a PC or on a tablet or whatever, as long as you're in the browser and you log in to the browser, like Bill said, that's going to give you full access when they're trying to go into applications and things like that. So you should, your students should be able to easily access as long as they're logged in properly. Thanks, Rob. Um, one thing I had on my notes to talk about, which feeds off of yours, is kind of the whole idea of who has the password and how we're entering in um, to people's accounts. Um, I know that uh, with, especially with the youngins, um, that it's, it's some people like logging in in two places as them. Um, and we're talking about our digital platform of Samaritans on the, on the digital road and, and people being content with their, with their passwords. And I know a lot, uh, different, uh, students and different age levels require different levels of support, but we are always encouraging people to have a conversation with their child or get them to log in and, and kind of see what they're seeing as opposed to trying to mimicking, um, or logging in in two places and kind of tracking what, um, what that looks like. And I know you'll elaborate a little bit on what the parent portal is kind of trying to be visioned out to help support that, um, as a parent, because I have, um, we all have, uh, people and experience with kids in the school and trying to keep and supporting them and their executive functioning and organization. So that's a key piece is have, try to get them to log in your child to log into their account in front of you, have the conversation and get them to show you what I'm about to show you in terms of uh, popular questions around uh, workspace and the student dashboard in, in Hapara. Because uh, that is a, a main piece. It's been a big push for our board for consistency. We heard that feedback during the learn at home phase last fall is just how can we get people to a central a central spot and um, the workspace and Hapara has been the, the piece that we are supporting our educators with uh, system wide to make sure that it's easier on parents to know where they're going. But as a student, um, imagine that I'm uh, with my child or I'm supporting my child. They've logged in. Everything's working at the, up until this point. Um, and I'm, get, I'm going to get them to get to the uh, student portal, either through the website or as it popping up automatically within our browser in OCSB, student.ca. I'm going to click on Workspace and Student Dashboard. So it's just the first one in line. I don't see the icon, but... Uh, it's usually there, so we'll uh, we'll make sure it's, uh, maybe I just needed to refresh that portal for a second. What you're seeing here as it's loading in is the um, student dashboard um, for, and we're not seeing any workspaces at this moment. Uh, you're seeing different things that are look, we're looking at. I'm just gonna refresh that because I see, we kind of had set ourselves up, so I might have to re refresh. There we go, we're probably, I'm just gonna backtrack a little bit. Um, we had these open preparing for this session and maybe it just timed out. So let's try that again. There we go. That looks a lot better. Always good to refresh in there. So what am I seeing right now as a, as a student and maybe as a parent talking to my student who's logged in um, and are getting them to explain what they're seeing? Right now, uh, there's two things I'm talking about. A student dashboard is a place, an entry point, kind of like the portal to see all my workspaces and kind of to-do lists. These are workspaces in no particular order other than maybe most recently edited across all my classes. At the top, you can filter down between the classes that they are currently in to kind of make it less um, uh, big in nature in terms of how, how far down and how many are, are being presented to the student. So I could narrow it down by class. So that is an option that I could do. Um, I can also look on the left-hand side to my to-do list. And this is where I really wanna direct you in the moment. I will emphasize though, is that not every task and not every card that is created in Hapara by the educator needs or should have 
a, uh, a timeline or a to-do or a due date uh, for it. So there is options in here that um, will give you access, especially from within the workspace that I'll show you. But this does help um, kind of regulate uh, some workflow for the student and for you because you can say, okay, well, log in, let's click on the to-do. I'm going to narrow this down to this class right here. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's science, maybe it's math, maybe it's French. And you can see that in this class, there's a couple things just right off the bat. There, uh, I've put a couple of the same examples on, so that's why it shows three uh, being due tomorrow. But I have something due Tuesday, um, October, and then some on October 13th. At the top, this is all of them. Some have no due dates. So if, if I go down, you can say these are no due dates. So I just mentioned a way in which a teacher may not put a due date. So you still see them in the class and things that are expected to be done in terms of tasks that need to be uh, completed or learning activities. At the top, there's an overdue. And that doesn't mean that the, the child can't complete it and submit it. It's just a notification that maybe it was yesterday that it was actually needed to be submitted or not. So this one is due tomorrow. So I'm gonna have my student or I'm the student clicking on it. And where will it open? It will open it up into the workspace uh, environment. You'll see a couple of things that I'm gonna elaborate on in a moment. You can see that there's a couple cards. So every time I refer to something as a card, it's these squares or rectangles um, that are on uh, the page. But how I got there, I'm just gonna backtrack a little bit. How I got there was I, um, went to the to-do list and clicked on an individual to-do item. There's another way to get there that I wanted to show you. And it's under workspaces. And I already see this one here, but I could narrow it down. And here's the workspace. And when the, when you, the student goes in, they click on, they see the same workspace. So a couple ways to get into the same workspace. And then here's what they're seeing. So I've created a couple tasks for um, this K-6 to webinar today, but the practice is the same no matter what level um, you're coming in from. You'll notice on the left-hand side, the student can see those due dates. On the left-hand side, Friday, September 25th, the 29th, and so forth. And then what is it that you see? It's hard to give everybody's concrete examples in a webinar or a live stream like this. Uh, so I just put one example in here, an article that I would want the uh, child to, to maybe read and reflect on. And then there's some sort of task that's associated with, uh, with that on the side. You will see in here that uh, there's a couple things um, that I'm seeing. This one is not on this document here. You can see this one is Friday, uh, the 20th, September 25th. And down here, that's Tuesday, September 29th. And another thing I'll get you to look at that you see on this screen is that this card is for individual evidence. So that means when that, when your child and when that student clicks on this box, that this, in this case, Google Slides will open up and already be a copy for that child. So you don't have to do anything. You don't have to make a copy. It's for you to start uh, writing. And the other piece here is called group evidence. So group evidence would mean that it is shared with other students, probably not the whole class, but maybe three or four or five, depending on what the learning activity is set up by uh, the teacher. And it can be on the side expanded to see that, okay, this one under group two has four students in it and it wouldn't be, you could see who that group is. And in this case, under group evidence, if you click on start and the other students uh, that they're grouped with click start, they would all be on the same document. They would be working collaboratively. But I'm going to go back to this individual evidence card for simplicity's sake. And I'm going to click on start. You're going to see it spin a little bit because it is go going to make a copy of that file. And then when it's ready, it will open up into um, what it is. It could be a link somewhere. It could be sending it somewhere. In this case, it's uh, Google Slides. The teacher has put in a template. And in this case, it's now a very basic empty template that the uh, student can go in and start uh, typing and giving titles. It's now their copy. How do I know this is because one, it was individual evidence and two, it shows up as uh, my name attached to it. So therefore it is, it gives me another reassurance that this is my copy. So in this case, I'm going to give it a, 
a title. I could add some text. Not all the work has to be done all at once. This could be a week long activity. I just have to keep on coming back to workspace and clicking on that card um, to access this, this uh, file. In the workspace, you can see now that it's clicked to submit. There's no start button, it's submit. So as a, as a student, I would know that I've already started that activity because it doesn't say start. On the teacher end of things, they know who's clicked uh, submit and start. There may be some prompts there from your classroom educator. Going back to the file itself, it's now just Google. I could do uh, probably talk for the next eight hours about different ways to use Google, and uh, but it's not the point of this session. But we did get asked some questions, especially um, for some tasks that are being asked of our, our young uh, students, maybe to insert a picture. We will work with uh, CSPA on our tech updates and some of the resources that we'll show you at the end of this to have some of those micro learning videos on how to maybe take a picture on your on your cell phone, your um, your iPhone or an Android, and how to get this into um, the slides in the first place. But because we're already here, I will show you how you can do that within Google Slides, assuming you've already got the picture taken um, and it is somewhere. When you're in this uh, um, viewpoint, you can go to insert and the first option is to upload from a computer. So if you did have some there, you can search the web. You can have uh, files in Google Drive. So if you had an iOS device, an iPhone, and you downloaded the Google Drive app and signed into their account, your child's account, you could take a picture directly into Google Drive. In this case, I'm just going to uh, show you another option, which is camera. So that if I click on camera, maybe I could take a picture just right um, from my webcam right into this Google slide. So I could hold something up maybe in front of it, or it's just me, or it's outside. But also, sometimes it's just a generic kind of stock photo. So what, if I go to search the web, it's actually searching for licensed to use photos that are, are filtered and appropriate with Google. If I'm going to put in Parliament buildings. Um, Buildings Canada, you can see it already popping up of Canada, maybe. And from there, I can just click and drag. Zoom. Okay, let's say I'm ready for some feedback uh, for the teacher, or I think I'm finished what I need to finish in here. This is where some of the workflow for our students is surrounding, um, then letting the teacher know, okay, I'm ready and giving them some uh, identification. So if I click on submit here, it will prompt the student, do you want to send the work to, to the teacher? And so there is a fail safe. Sometimes um, they do so by accident. And that's just a communication with the teacher that Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so, I forgot, I accidentally hit it. Can you resend it to me for edit? And they will know what to do from that standpoint. But in this case, I will send it. I will send the work to the teacher. And you can see how the submit button is gone. And now it identifies as submitted. When it is submitted, there has been a process change and an uh, accessibility change of settings for that document. When I open up that view, it has changed now to comment only. What does that mean, comment only? It means I'm now in kind of a view only of what I submitted. I cannot type in there. I'm trying to type. I'm clicking with my cursor. But to comment, I can do a couple things is that I could highlight the text or the title and go to insert. And there's a shortcut key there, control alt M. If I do a comment, I could put a comment there and saying, I forgot to add some detail here and then put some details on there. That could be the student reminding the teacher that I actually meant to put something in there. And I can click comment. And now it's in the kind of margins, so to speak, of the uh, Google Slides. This can be done in Google Docs and different uh, platforms in, in G Suite. The teacher can also use this for feedback for the student and kind of work on giving that. But in the moment, um, if the student does get uh, uh, click and submit and want to add something, they can add it in comment. And then uh, they move forward from that. Down here, before I pass it over to Rob, um, there is a My Task Space. You might see this little box uh, up here. 
on this on the screen and it's going to be empty and the teacher may have put it there on on purpose because they may have given you an open-ended task where you were allowed to create something or use different softwares or create something in google drive in a in a google drawing or a google doc where they didn't mandate that you use the template that they they created and so if you do that um you might see this box and uh, and some we did get asked on the last uh, question about colors and sometimes colors are something that the teachers use to associate so this task and this task are are, are connected because maybe the colors are the same they could go into their google drive and grab the file from google drive or they could link it to wherever something that maybe they created so you may see something like this um, and it may be an empty box but it's, usually there would be an associated instruction uh, maybe in this in this column um, from your teacher or just um, live if they're talking to them synchronously uh, about what to do and what to put in there. And usually there will be a bit more details, but they could drop it in. And another question we get is that, no, you will not always say, see three columns. You could see a maximum of four, but you might only see one of these columns. And it might not always be an evidence column um, where they are um, expected to do work. It could be an informational workspace. And of course, they can add more evidence here as well. But I think in terms of what the questions were on the document, how do I get there? How do I submit work? Um, I think we've covered that pieces, unless I'm missing something uh, there, Rob, if you want to clarify. For yeah, me. so I think that's great, Bill. And I think that covered most of it. A couple of questions came in that you could show, though. If you hop back into that document. Yes, sure. Just when at the top, you're going to see uh, there's a few questions about read and write. Oh, yes. And PDF documents and things. So you'll see at the mm -hmm. top there, there's a bar. If Bill can just highlight that bar right. with your cursor, a little wiggle up there. Yeah. This is the read and write extension for Google that helps us support uh, learners with different learning styles. So it will read things out to kids. It'll allow them to answer a pile of those questions. Yeah, Thank you. Um, our French consultants have been sharing with all the French teachers about what settings would need to be changed. Um, we are also, when it comes into assessment about providing a content, the PDF is not the most uh, interactive type tool, but using this and highlighting, and you can pull um, details out um, into opening a doc just by highlighting features. It's a really robust tool for anyone um, to use. So yes, definitely it's something that uh, all our schools and our, our students and our teachers um, are becoming should be very familiar with if not becoming more and more familiar with so good uh, good comment on that and reading it to you is definitely uh, a great option before you mentioned so you mentioned the read and write was there something else to that no, nope, that's good there's a bunch okay. around that around the french access to it and stuff so okay. that's great oh and then before you totally leave can you hop out of that doc go yep. back into the student portal there are some questions in, we're going back to slow motion here. So they're wondering, how did you get into HAPRA workspace to begin with? Yep, sounds good. So I was able to access the student portal. Typically, I would search my schools. Um, I know you may be virtual, but in the homeschool you're associated with, search them, get to their website, um, and be able to access this. But the students, it should pop up if they log in uh, for themselves. I clicked on workspace and student dashboard on the student portal. And usually this would be accompanied with some sort of prompt or instruction from the classroom teacher saying, go to this workspace. It's titled this. Sometimes the icons on the right hand side are um, chosen specifically by classroom teachers to say, go to the one with the, you know, the books or the Lego blocks or something. So it's another way for our students to enter. In this case, they then just clicked on the workspace that the teacher asked them to go to. Again, they can filter by class, but if it's recent, it should pop up and then they were able to access the workspace that uh, they've been instructed to go to. Good. And if they're logged in, parents, then and, and their little icon on the top right there shows they're logged in, then when they click into any of those tools, almost all of them will automatically log in as that student. So when they clicked into HAPRA, it knew who the student was and who their classes and teachers are, and that mm -hmm. all comes up automatically, so you don't have to do anything for that. That's right. And that kind of will probably flow into some of your topics there, Rob, but yeah. we got a lot of questions about apps and, and you know, things like Raz Kids, you know, they were the best experience on a Chromebook, if you can get it, is to click on it through being logged into your account that way, as opposed to needing a password on an iPad or something like right. that. Um, so Zorbits, um, Mathletics, that type of thing, and Raz Kids, all just by clicking on uh, the portal on a Chromebook right in there, no passwords. 
Yeah. And I mean, if you're on hardware and talking about Chromebooks and those kinds of apps, they're very interactive and touch friendly. So if you're looking at Chromebooks for your kids, um, for the last several years, we've only been purchasing flip touch Chromebooks because we use Android apps. We use interactive apps, especially in elementary where kids are touching the screen. So you want to look for those kinds of devices as well if you're looking. All right. We'll go quickly through a couple other things and then we'll take the there's quite a few questions, then quite of them are good to answer and they'll be quick answers. So we'll try and just stream through a pile of these questions at the end. We'll show you a couple more things that groups of questions fit into, and then we'll hit a bunch of the response, the questions that are online. All right, I will present real quick. And I just want, in case you guys have forgotten where to go out there to actually put in your questions, I'm gonna share that again real quick. All right. So if you go to tinyurl.com, so you need to open up another tab in your browser and or on your phone, either way, and go to OCSB in capitals and then tech questions. So I'll leave it up for five more seconds. Tinyurl.com, OCSB tech questions. And that's where you'll want to be. So I'm just going to cover off a couple other things real quick, and then we'll hit your questions for you. So Bill just finished up with HAPRA. So Parent Portal is something that we launched in June to really try and get, you can get there by registering if you haven't done that. We have like 45,000 accounts in, so a lot of the parents are in now. But you can go to ocsb.ca, which is our board website, slash parent portal, and that's going to take you here. So ocsb.ca slash parent portal, it's on our main website, and it's going to bring you into this environment where it tells you how to register and get online and get some support for parent portal. So you click the register, you have to have your email and um, some information about your child so you can securely log in, and then it's going to let you in. And if you have trouble, there's an email on here you can connect with to try and get you in. We do want you to get in because that's how we're going to deliver a lot of our content now for parents. Once you're in, you're going to get into something like this. Let me just go home here. And I'm going to log in. Uh, and because I hadn't been in for a while, actually, <clears throat> it brings me back to the portal. And you'll see we have one for teachers and students up here. And if your student especially is in um, grade 12 and possibly turning 18, then they will have access to things that you will no longer have as a parent unless they contact the school and give them permission. When they turn 18, legally, we have to cut off your access and give it to them unless they give schools permission to release that information to you. This one follows the law on that. So when a kid flips 18, Report cards, only they're going to get them unless they contact the school and allow for that, for you to actually have access to them. This is the default login page, and it may or may not look exactly like the one you're looking at if you go in. Um, report cards and things will appear here. This account is in our play environment because I needed anonymized data to come in and show you and share with you. But in here, you would see your report cards that are coming up. So those reporting periods are coming up in a few weeks. So that's where you're going to see, depending on if you're in a quadmester like in elementary, sometime by the end of October, you're going to see reporting periods pop up in here with data. If a teacher chooses to sh share marks and things ongoing by using a grade book in here, then you may see that on this page. That's a choice they get to make. The other thing that schools are asking to check is their, in, their personal contact information to make sure they have the right data. If you're looking for that, it's here under child progress and then contacts. So I'm just gonna click on that. So if you had multiple children in here, there would be a list there. And the first one here is contacts. And if I click that, I'm gonna see all the people that I've put in contact so that the schools can access and communicate with them in cases of regular communication or in cases of emergency. So it's important to go through, and it's a, it's a process we go through every year with all of our families, is just make sure that that's good. If there's an issue, please email the school and let them know what needs to be fixed. <clears throat> the other thing that we have up here is, is our portal. So if I go back to the slide, 
deck and I talk about digital forms a little bit. Actually, I'll talk about one more thing is IEPs. So the I, I don't have that yet. We're working on it. But we're very, very hopeful that by October 15th, when IEPs are due, we're going to have them digital. So we are working on it actively. We're trying to get it up. It's never existed. We're trying to get it up. So it's going to be a digital document for you. That will be accessible through the parent portal, like the report card. The other thing is that we're adding, and we started adding them today, and we'll add things like uh, access to the virtual uh, academies on the parent portal links. So on the parent portal, on the side over here, you'll see resources and applications for parents. This is a playground, don't forget, so it's not exactly what you're going to see. But over here, we're starting to add this content in so you can access resources. And if we pop back into our presentation, the next one is digital forms. If you're new to our board, you would have seen that now you're registering your kids online. Okay. We're trying to get away from the paper. So that was something we tried to make happen again at the end of the year last year. So it'll be a secure page and then you'll access the forms from there. The forms will be live and interactive <clears throat> and they'll be secured by the student login so that we know that it's going to be a secured access to the forms for when they're submitted. So we'll send you more information about that. Um, we're just in testing right now with our first form and we'll start to roll those over the next couple weeks. All right. So I think, okay, another big question that's on there too is, I have lots of questions on here about support for Chromebooks and things like that. Um, our board has been structured to support our internal staff, um, students, and then the devices we buy because they're controlled and we know what they are. Um, so that's what we've been staffed for, and that's what we've been supporting over the years. So we're in this mode now where lots of students are at home. Some of the teachers are at home because of certain circumstances. So it is a different environment, and our resources are a bit stretched right now. And so we are working towards ways to better support um, people who are at home. It's a new place for all of us. We're all learning and changing as this goes. And we have not perfected this. We are working on it. So we are going to try and improve that support at home for now. Please direct things through the teacher because we do not have any kind of public facing support for all the tech that's out there. It's just an exponential number of contacts for us, and we just don't have the staff ready to shift into that. So we will be looking at trying to see what more we can do out there, but for now, please contact the teacher and we will try and work through them. Same, there's lots of questions about how do I get a Chromebook or how do I get uh, access to the internet? Those are all done through the teacher as well. And we encourage you, if you have the means, to acquire your own Chromebooks because we do not have infinite means. We have set budgets. We bought a bunch of Chromebooks to try and help support the system. Chromebooks for us on the enterprise scale are very hard to get right now because many school boards have been doing the same thing. So we don't have instantaneous access to more technology. So we encourage you if you have the means and if you don't, for sure, connect with your teacher and make sure they know the situation and they will apply for one for you. And we, we do still have some devices to deploy. And if you're struggling with internet and things and you haven't checked your bandwidth, maybe you're having struggles with your meets and they're breaking up, it could be your bandwidth. And uh, there's a little thing within Chrome you can just run called speed test. Just go up and search for it, speed test. And it will check your bandwidth and tell you if your bandwidth's under 10 megabits per second, it's not awesome for doing live video calls. So it's something to consider. Um, if it's more than 10, you should be okay. Some of the teachers still, they may be at home and not out of school teaching. They may be struggling with bandwidth as well. We also have discovered recently, actually just this week, that there's an issue with one of the versions of our computers that is out there in teachers' hands, and it is struggling with tons of video. So if they're trying to play a movie and every 30 kids are all on video, that one particular machine is struggling. So we're trying to find out if any of those are in the virtual school and to actually go and replace them. We're just testing that this week as well. I think that's enough for me for now. And uh, we're going to jump into this next slide, which is all about supporting you guys. So Bill, do you want to talk to this? Sure, I'm just going to feed off of uh, your previous points because there was some questions in there about Google uh, Meet and Gridview. 
Um, so I think part of that was there was um, a lot of these extensions that we're referring to are created by third party providers and not Google themselves. And in this, in this case, um, it worked really well for the system for a long time, but as Google started to create their own products, which mimicked those ones, uh, that product started to fail. And so now that um, in Google Meet in, in the OCSB, you can get more than uh, 16 uh, viewers on that screen. Um, we have removed Google Meet Grid View. There is, a, there is a newer one out there, but there's no need for that across being pushed to all our students. So you would have seen it disappear from the extensions and now that that experience should be. We've also, um, they can use the tools because um, it's new for all. Um, education was not this way as of March this past year. So um, we continue to adapt and uh, as we move forward. But as Rob has this already shared, I'll get him to keep on sharing it. One of these a uh, couple questions we got was I missed this uh, the, the this morning sessions for for the seven uh, to twelve or can you review this like I mentioned where will this be housed um, we will certainly try to share it amongst all our, our virtual academies and virtual elementary school we will share it with our communications department and um, we'll also share it um, with our CSPA partners but where we're going to house it probably is going to be in our OCSB how to. It is a YouTube, YouTube sorry, um, playlist that uh, houses a lot of our information for, for you. A lot of the common questions we make videos on. So Rob, if I can get you to click on the OCSB how-to link. And we will link all of these into the yeah. parent portal resources for you so you have access to them. Yeah, you won't see them yet on the parent portal, but we will we'll move them. Today, forward. you should see them today. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, at the moment, if you're in there, it's not there. <laughs> Um, so in here, this is for parents and guardians, and uh, all of our schools have been shared with this. So you might only got received one video from your teacher. You may have received a link from your school. There's a whole bunch of different communication practices going on, but we will make sure that we will link this in for you. You can see the first topic is how to navigate the K-6 portal. Uh, the next one is accessing student Hapara workspace, and you can see that they range from seven minutes to two minutes. We try to keep them around two or three minutes, but sometimes it's not possible. So this is um, our title of OCSB How To. It is a playlist, it is, sorry, a channel within YouTube. And so if you do search it within YouTube, if you are on there, you should be able to access it and subscribe to it. But otherwise the link will be on the parent portal. I'll direct you back to the slide, please, Rob, and we'll click on the CSPA link. As mentioned, we partner closely with CSPA, um, our Catholic Parents Association. And uh, each month they have a newsletter and it is pertaining to all uh, the OCSB, but there always is a sort of tech tip type um, section on there. And you can see at the top, there is subscribe to our newsletter. Um, in there, it might be something, and I, I usually provide some tech tips with, uh, with our CSPA executive um, per pertaining to questions we get in the moment. So it usually reflects questions that are coming up within the last week before the newsletter goes out. So it might be, uh, be Chrome profiles, it might be logging into Hapara, and that's what we had on the previous newsletter. But please subscribe to it if you haven't or it hasn't come across your, uh, your plate. And then finally, um, in addition, there are websites, uh, in this case, the OCSP Elementary Virtual Program. And uh, you can see some buttons, uh, some tabs across the middle there, how it works, frequently asked questions, and then the online how-tos are kind of some of the videos that we've already shown, or not, this was the video in this case, but like how to sign into Chrome, how to get into this, uh, the student portal and uh, the student dashboard. As you go down, you can see the announcements. So there's the parent tech support for, for today and different announcements that goes on there. So that we're trying not to bring you to too many different places. We're trying to bring you to a streamlined place um, and then expand out uh, from there. So that is, a, that is a great tool for you to have bookmarked. And it was... Um, virtualprogram.ocsb.ca. Okay. I think for that standpoint, um, we're going back to our question document and I've been putting a lot of things on there. Um, and uh, All right. And, yeah, so are you we ready? Just go, I'm, I'm thinking, there's the URL again, if you have more questions. And yeah. I'm thinking just rapid question yeah. response because I know yeah. I can go through about 30 or 40 of these real quick. We're yeah. coming up on the end of our timeline. But uh, we will try and plow through. There's quite a few on here. So let me go to the top of this list because I jumbled a bunch up there. Uh, one of the things I wanted to just remind people is that all these teachers working in virtual, uh, they've never done this before. 
So they are learning along this with you at home and your elementary students and with the students. And they're bound to make a few mistakes and things here and there. So just try to be empathetic and forgiving. It, it is a pro elementary kids because um, I don't seem to be able to send emails to them. No, is the answer simply. So we do fence our elementary students in email so that uh, strangers can't actually email them. So we have done that purposefully to stop that. There were a couple of incidences and we actually just had an instance because if a teacher actually requests for a class to be opened up, they can get a principal to request for that. And then we we need to remember to close it again because if we don't, it's it's not that unusual actually that something bad would happen. So there are random or purposeful attacks on emails and we don't want those hitting our elementary kids. So we do fence elementary kids and uh, emails from outside cannot get into them. So that was a popular question on here. We also have a bunch of questions. Like, I'm just going to rapid fire through a bunch, Bill, if you're good. So yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, I'll pop in when you have a break. I'll yeah. have a break. Yeah. So uh, that was great too. All the patches and software for our Chromebook. Chromebooks manage themselves. So as long as you power them up occasionally, they kind of update themselves and do everything they need. So you really shouldn't have to be too worried about it. You can go into the bottom right corner and then go into about Chrome and it will tell you, but really they self-manage. They self-manage their securities. They self-manage their updates. And there were some questions about what hardware do I buy? And it is a it is up to you what you buy because we've moved down to everything into the cloud. Chromebooks are very, very easy to manage and are, um, as a platform goes, quite a secure platform because they do auto-update. They update in the background, grounds, so you're not always waiting for things to happen. And they provide a lot of control for parents and, and for the school board with those school accounts. Because when they log into a Chromebook in that account, they're in a signed in account that's just that account. So when teachers are work with, working with them, they really don't have the ability to jump out and do other things. So we, we try to have it set up that way because kids then are focused on what they're doing while they're learning. So you can choose. We would recommend a Flip Touch 4 gig 32 Chromebook. That is the standard. And then from there, you could move up. But we recommend the Flip Touch to give kids access to that interactive screen because a lot of our applications are like that. And we do use Android applications on top of the Google Chrome. So those Android apps are basically phone-based kind of apps. And your phone is touch. Okay. So we're Android using that Auto. phone. And my Google phone is talking to me. Sorry. So that's what we would recommend is a Chromebook. If you want to get something else, certainly, as long as it supports a Chrome browser, it's good. Um, my daughter wants to calibrate with her classmates, but we shut down all those communication tools. So again, these were requests because of behavior of students um, that they were using them outside of class maybe not for learning purposes. So there were some issues around that. They can collaborate in documents and do things together even outside of classroom, but it is a reason that we shut down some of those tools. Bill, do you want to comment on that at all? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's something that we always are listening to from parents and students and, and educators about platforms we are providing to uh, give them that collaborative experience. But just as you mentioned, the, the, we always weigh the pros out of the cons. In this case, the cons outweighed the pros with that type of tool uh, and the way it was being used. But we're always reevaluating um, tools and needs of the system. Okay. Um, the Lenovo tablet, I'd have to look at. It's probably, it's an Android thing versus a Chrome thing, I'm afraid. So if you're in Chrome on Android, I'm I won't swear because I've not tried it actually, if it will go to Zorbits or not. It was a question on here. So I don't have the perfect answer for that. I'd actually have to test it. Um, through Chrome though, it should work. It says a Chromebook. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, have to try specific scenario, too specific on the hardware. I'd have to check it. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll jump in quickly with some others. of the app pieces. So uh, one was about read and write. And does everyone in the board have it turned on? All students have it pushed to them automatically. So it would be up in the top right of their extension bars. And if they're in a Google Doc, it didn't link to other documents, but it's an easier way to manage Google. So a lot of the tasks that your, your child might be used going into workspace will open up a Google Doc or a Google Slide. So the, to me, they go hand in hand um, from that piece. 
and that kind of comes into that. There's a, a lot of questions that uh, in here that are going into like assessment. How will you collect it? How will you do that? And that really will be um, feedback that we work with uh, with our our virtual uh, leadership teams and um, and the school board as a whole because uh, it kind of steers away from this conversation. But it definitely is something we need to address. But would come from our student success departments um, in that piece. So we'll we'll bring that feedback back and know that it needs to be communicated. All these all these questions on there surrounding assessment and the same thing for scheduling and online hours. I know that um, there's been a lot of meetings lately about just making sure that the times that were there and uh, and can it be perfect for all your three um, three students or your child, children, sorry, at home and. Um, if it does, then the, the person down the street the street may not have the same uh, schedule based on so many factors, so many logistics. Um, so the scheduling is not going to be perfect, but it should um, try to best rep rep represent a school day um, with those times. So um, again, that scheduling will be left to the virtual school um, uh, team uh, uh, from that standpoint, I think. There was a question. Are you, are you good? Yeah. There's a question, but my child had a has an email name that's incorrect. That's probably from data in our student information system. So that's where they get generated from typically. So that data needs to be changed. And a teacher, um, you can put that through a teacher to say, hey, my email's wrong. And they can take that and fix that along the, the path that they need to. Yeah, and that goes into the the uh, update contact questions we had about I'm in the parent portal. I noticed some things incorrect or a verification form came came back and it's incorrect um if the physical physical paper came back and you're not you're being requested to return it then that's one piece otherwise emailing the school saying that i want this data changed would be the uh, the proper process there's a question on gradebook and assessments and standardization so um part of what we have to do under OECTA is Teachers have the rights to actually um, use different ways to grade. We have suggested using a standard one, but it's new. And I think we'll see teachers move more and more into the Compass Gradebook. That is the one we're recommending and supporting right now, but it is not a mandate that they use it. They do have to use it to enter final grades. And that's why you see the report card and final grades come up if you go into the parent portal. They may choose to use it for other grades, but it is a choice right now. And so not all, that's not going to be consistent. I think a lot of the themes are, I know there's just so many questions and they're good questions. So the key thing that we can promise is to uh, make sure to continue to uh, look at them, to consolidate them, to communicate with all the, the people that we need to communicate and collaborate with um, to bring back the continued feedback. And again, make sure that um, that as a parents association that that's brought to CSPA as well. We we are listening on all levels, um, and uh, we know it's not perfect, and we are continuing to adapt day by day to make sure uh, things um, can run as smoothly as possible. But I'm I am respective of the time. I'm, I think we've hit a lot of the big yeah. things, that we did, and we tried to go through the the rapid fire piece. Again, we did record this. It is recording um, and it would be available. We'll try to get that communication out. So if you missed parts, um, it will be available. And if not, you can share it with uh, some of your um, parents and uh, in the community or who you know. And I think other than that, I just I just want to thank um, the parent community for for being part of this today. Um, I know it's uh, never time is the perfect time, so that's why we're recording it. But thank you for the feedback and for, for participating. And I will leave this uh, URL up for a bit. And if you have comments on th if this is an appropriate format for us to get information out to see more of these, you could add some comments on that form. Just so we understand your feelings around that. And if there's even topical areas or something you want to throw into some of those comments, feel free to do that. And we can see what we can do about actually addressing that. So we'll make our best effort at that. But again, like Bill said, thank you for joining us. And uh, if this was a good format, hopefully we'll see you again. Take care. It's tough times. I know everybody's stressing and struggling with this. Thanks.